Hi everybody, welcome to the channel. Thanks for joining me. My name is Dave and today we're going to do a request by one of the subscribers to do a walk around video around my car. So we'll get on with it. But first, I have to say, I'm off work. I'm not having many operation yet, but I'm off work for other reason. I'm, I'll go into that maybe in the future. But anyway, um, it's Saturday and uh, I'm parked up in my favourite reservoir spot. Too many cars in uh, Cadinia Park, so I've come to this little spot where I came to do my awning video. So let's get on. My car, the history and its current setup. Now, I'm going to be reading from a script, so you'll have to bear with me. I've been asked by a subscriber to do a walk around video of my car, so here it is. I have an MY2000 SE Jackaroo with a 4GH13 litre diesel and an Ace in One, a 3040LE auto transmission. I bought the car around five years ago from an older guy who had owned the car from new. It was being sold with a head gasket issue, which obviously we knew it wasn't. So the history. The car obviously had injector sleeve seal issues. It wasn't a head gasket at all. After fixing the injector sleeve in the injector, the car ran perfectly apart from a ticking noise. A bit like when you hear a rocker going tick, 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 and, and, and we couldn't figure it out. So we stripped off the cylinder head. We, we, we checked the flex plate to see if it was cracked. We checked the components in the engine, but we couldn't pinpoint exactly where it was coming from. So we ended up stripping off the cylinder head. The previous owner, when the injector sleeves failed, must have run it dry because as a consequence of the seals being damaged, it had damaged number four cylinder quite badly. It was quite badly scored. Also, one of the piston rings had broken off and what was it caused the initial damage. Now, we didn't know that until we took the engine apart, but that's just what the damage was. This usually happens due to a lack of coolant causing the bar to expand. Being made from hardened steel, the piston rings are brittle and they're not designed to take the snapping forces outside of the piston groove. They are far stronger than the alloy piston. The piston takes the brunt of the damage, but the piston ring is, can get wedged between the piston and the bar causing an irreparable damage to the bore, which had happened in this case. Whilst we had suitable spare pistons, there was only two options available regarding the cylinder bore. Replace the cylinder liner or replace the engine block. As the only reasonable option was an Indian supplier that did not respond to our emails, plus changing a liner was a lot of work, we sourced a second car with a good engine. The second car came from Cockatoo. It had been sitting for a long time in the garden of the cellar and it wasn't in particularly good shape. However, the engine turned over, had a good compression, so we bought the donor car for another $500. The guy even lent us his trailer to bring it home and then he came and collected it from us, which was very nice of him. He was a very nice guy. He was a carpenter. We used Rob's winch to winch the car halfway up the drive and then pushed the car into the garage using Rob's car and a spare tyre between them to protect it. We purchased the engine stand and a hoist and removed the engine from the car and mounted it on the stand. Rob sold some parts off the car like a door, a couple of doors and some other bits and pieces uh, to, make up the other, to make up the other $500 and we got a stroke of luck and Rob sold both front and rear discs because they were wide track and the only requirement to that person was that they took the whole car which they did and we had our $500 back and a free engine. Rob stripped the engine and we found some light scoring in the balls which he honed out, fitting new piston rings and new gaskets including the new main seal. We decided not to replace the main and big main bearing shells because they looked brand new and were in excellent condition, with no wear at all. Rob reassembled the engine. After doing a compression test we were happy with the results so we installed the engine into the car. The engine ran well and the gearbox was in good condition too, but... There were other things that needed addressing before the car was sent for a roadworthy. Brakes. While the brakes worked, they had Repco pads and were quite worn. They were in good working condition for the roadworthy, but did require replacement, which I have done. Wheel bearings. So the car failed its initial roadworthy check because I stupidly forgot to check the wheel bearings. And all four bearings were loose, so you get a knocking noise. Upon removal, the required replacing, so I sourced four new bearings and fitted them. Purchased a luggage scale and used that to set the pull-off weight and adjust them correctly. And if you're not sure what that is, I'll bring, pop that up on the screen now. The alternator. There's a story behind the alternator. When Rob put his previous jacket almost on its side in a mud puddle, 
He asked to use my alternators as his was stuffed. Before the initial roadworthy, I got his old alternator and fitted new bearings and brushes, and it worked well. However, upon returning to get the car re-inspected, I was waiting to turn right into the inspection centre. The alternator seized solid and snapped the drive belt. When I spoke with the inspector, he told me he didn't need the car to be running and it was fine, but he did not know how I would get home. The car passed and I removed the damaged belt and drove it in the one kilometre to my house with no alternator. I replaced the alternator and it was fine right up to swamping the engine again in another mud puddle. I got the alternator replaced under warranty and it was a much better make. Vic Roads. Throughout the car's life, Vic Roads have been less than helpful and I'm a downright amateur. When I got my roadworthy, the next step was to get the car registered. It was during COVID lockdowns and the Vic Roads could not give me an appointment until January the 28th. It was just after the lockdowns and there was that many people getting the cars registered because they couldn't go overseas. The appointment was not until January the 28th, 2019, which was in mid-December. This was in mid-December 2018. This was well outside the time frame provided by Vic Roads after the roadworthy to get the registration completed. However, they did say they had vacancies at Morwell and Swan Hill in late December. I took the Morwell one and drove to Morwell, got my car inspected and it was passed and registered. Oddly, there were no queues or other people getting their cars registered at the time. So I don't know what the big deal is with Vic Roads. Anyway, as I wanted the space in the back, I decided to remove all five seats from the rear and make the car into a two-seater. On the Vic Roads website, links below, I state that I did not need to take any further action than removing my seats. However, at the same time, by coincidence, Tim Bates had released a video, link below, of his rear seat removal, citing that Vic Rhodes had given him a roadworthy reduction. He also stated that he had called Vic Rhodes and they had informed him that they needed to inspect the vehicle to get it reclassified. He did not state this on their website. I visited Danden on Vic Roads to get my car reclassified. They inspected my car and gave me a receipt for zero cost and said it would, I would receive a certificate in the post. I asked about a reduction in the road where then I was told they'd never heard of it. As I never received my certificate or reclassification, I contacted Vic Roads and was told my car had not been changed and they did not think I would get a reduction in Roadworthy. I was informed to visit Vic Roads, so I went to Packingham Vic Roads and spoke with someone there. They told me they'd never heard of a reduction and told me to contact the TAC. I contacted the TAC and as expected they called me and said that Vic Roads handled this type of thing on their behalf. They advised to speak with my local council's MP when I told them what the trouble I'd had. To cut a long story short, I ended up getting my local MP, who is the Shadow Secretary for the Police, involved, whose administrator, I can't remember their name, but they were the best ever, so good, did a, such a good job. They sorted the whole thing out and I received a phone call from an agent at Vic Roads who apologised profusely for Vic Roads' behaviour and not knowing the, their own rules. They informed me that they had checked with the correct department and they had confirmed that my vehicle had not been classified but they had now had it correctly reclassified. They also paid back over two years of roadworthy reductions. My roadworthy is well over $100 a year cheaper. So, moving on to the car. Wheels and suspension. I have 16-inch alloy wheels, the standard Jackaroo wheels. But the bigger tyres, 265, 75, R16, 32 inch tyres are the Hankook Dynapro 82 all terrains. I have to say, I'm not a lover of the look of these tyres, but they do perform very well. I have had no problem with them whatsoever. Previously, I had Falcon Wild Peaks, which were also very good tyres. Unfortunately, if you looked at a blade of grass wrong, they would punch you. So I had to get them replaced, they were full of holes. And actually, um, if we look at the spare wheel on the back, you'll see that that was the, the one remaining wild peak that didn't have a, a hole in it. So I've got that as a spare wheel. The car has uprated springs at the rear, giving a two inch lift combined with adjusted torsion bars. The torsion bars, uh, I lifted the torsion bars to make the car on equal stance. So as you can see, it's, it's lifted slightly, two inches. The suspension shocks are Tough Dog foam cell shock all round to give a less wallowing ride on bends. The car was really wallowy. I had to sort it out, so I put Tough Dog suspension on. I don't think you can see that either, but I do have the sticker on the back of the car there. Now, the reason I went with Tough Dog was they were it was about seven, eight hundred dollars for four shockers, whereas everywhere else was twelve hundred for decent shocks. 
and they did Jackaroo shock. So I would recommend them. They seem to be a lot, a lot firmer, but I haven't compromised on the ride. It's still a good ride. Front wheels have Asin Warner manual locking hubs. All wheels have Wi-Fi TPMS. That's these things here, and the TPMS is in the car. I'll show you that in a little while. Running gear and brakes. Track rods, they're uprated. So you can see the uprated track rods in there. They're a lot thicker. They have F250, uh, F250 track rod ends on them. If anybody's interested in those, I'll put a link below to a Facebook page. Clayton uh, Spencer is the man who to speak to for those. Okay, next page. Brakes. Brakes are horsepower rotors with horsepower pads. I don't know if you can see them. You probably can't. But they've got horsepower rotors, horsepower pads, and the standard Jackaroo uh, brake pad caliper. De brake fluid is Dot 3 Penrite. Rear differential is a standard LSD. The front op is an open differential with an auto locker fitted. Um, I think you've heard my auto locker on um, on videos. You, it clunks a bit when you go around corners because it disengages and ratchets. Bodywork and trim. This is an ARB non-winch bull bar. It's been converted to take a winch. So um, somebody who's related to me works at ARB and makes bull bars. And before you all start requesting things, I can't get any. Um, the only thing I got free here was that ARB sticker on the front. We welded up the two holes. We, we well, cut in a new hole in the centre. We made a winch cradle and the winch sits in there on the front. The winch is a £12,000 King's Dominator winch with cab controls and a cable Wi-Fi winch controller, which I'll show you. The in-cab controls are down here. This is them here. That's the on and off switch, and then they work from there. Okay. I have an Oricom 6.5 DBI UHF radio antenna. This, this is it here, with the spring on it for corrugations. And this is a GME FM antenna. I use that for the radio, so I don't have to use the original electric aerial that comes with a car. I have a safari snorkel, so we'll go around and I have got a video of me replacing that. There's a video of that, but this is a safari snorkel. It's got jackaroo written on it, and it's got safari written up here. It is a genuine safari snorkel, and it's the only one I could find that would fit correctly to the airbox inside. So just be aware of that, because most of them on eBay don't fit the diesel airbox. They fit the petrol airbox. There is a problem with this. I have a King's Prado 120 roof rack with homemade roof bars. Obviously, if you home make your roof bars, they've got to be at different heights to get them level. As you can see, I've got square and U bolts holding them on. We'll put brackets on the rear so it would hold the bar on. And on the front there, you can see it just in there. I have a King's 2.5 meter by 2.5 meter side awning right in there, which I've shown you in the past in another video. I also have a King's 1.4 by 2 meter rear awning for when you stop to make lunch, etc. And I have a King's shower awning here. Uh, that's the best thing I ever bought. We use that for a toilet and we use it for a shower. And when I get my rooftop tent on, that will come in and make it easy to go to there when we're out of the tent on the night time. The King's high lift jack and shovel brackets. There's the high lift jack and shovel. There's the brackets that hold them on. Kings don't sell them anymore, so you'll have to buy them from somewhere else. I've got an Anaconda high lift jack in there, and I've got a Bunnings long handle shovel, both fastened in there. I have four tread recovery boards, which I don't have with me. I don't need to show you those. They normally fit in the back of the roof rack there, because I have a roof bag. BCF full length roof rack bag, which I can't show you in here either, because I haven't got that with me. And a Kings 20 inch laser light bar. Now there's a story behind this laser light bar. You can see it up there. You see the cable used to come down here, down the trim and into the bonnet and, and uh, away. But when I got my windscreen replaced because it was leaking by Brian's, the guy gave me a ticking off and said I shouldn't do that. He said, take it down the rear. So now my cable goes down through the rear and through the car and that's how that gets lit up. I did a join up here and uh, fitted it there with some loom tape, etc.
and I've got a 68 litre auxiliary fuel tank with 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 splitter. So this is the splitter here. This is the fuel tap. Let me open the fuel door. I had to modify the inner wing. So this is the splitter. I've got a lever here to, to go down to the auxiliary tank and then up to the into the normal tank. That gives me 145 litres. The engine and transmission temperature monitor is here. What that does, I'll turn it on, is it, it monitors the temperature, has a high engine temperature alarm, a transmission temperature alarm of 120 degrees. And then it tells you the temperature is 82 and 54 by the way of two sensors. I have uh, two piranha gauges. One is EGT on the left and the one on the right is uh, turbo boost that just lets you know if they're working okay and, and what your temperature is what else have uh, I got? the TPMS monitor so, I can't... so it's there, it's on, it's working, that, that monitors the temperature the only problem is it's not an off-road TPMS if you drop the tyre pressures lower than I think it's, it's set to the lowest setting, I think it's 17 psi of course if you set your tyres to 18 psi when you get up in the morning and you turn your car on what happens is you you get alarms left, right and centre, so you have to turn it off. So I was thinking of replacing that with a off-road alarm, but I haven't found a decent one yet. I've got a King's head, Heads Up display speedometer there. It also ties in with the, the speedometer on the VMS HD 700 here. I've got King's dash cams front and in the rear, just for safety really, for my own protection. So the off-road navigator comes up, it shows you your speed. You see your speed on the right there. It ties up with the speedometer on there. The issue with it is they're slightly different. So I presumed that the VMS was correct and I there is some adjustment on the King's heads-up display. So I adjusted them so they were both at the same speed. Uh, this that, That's my HD700 off-road navigator. I also have a, a VMS 3D navigator somewhere. Let me have another better look. Thought it was in here. So this is a 3D navigator. It fits onto there like that so I can navigate when I'm off road. There's power for it. We'll plug it in and see how it goes. Okay, so there's my off road navigator. The VMS product, it's the upgraded version of this. Um, it just does 3D uh, off road maps all the time. I also have a to topographical, a couple of topical graphical maps to add to it when it catches up. And I do that until I've uh, until it's established a signal. The one problem with it is it takes ages to get a GPS signal. And it says I'm at near happy go lucky, which I'm not. <laughs> anyway, it is what it is. That's Walhalla, so. Okay, so let's turn that off. We don't need that on anymore. Power off. The, the bad thing about this 3DX is when it's powered on, when you've got your power into it from the car, it will keep turning back on. Sorry. And these are the best thing ever. Nappy sacks. Great, great bin bags. Because they don't smell. Except you can't get them back in when you've got your VMS in. Alright, so I've got a rear LED strip light in the rear door. For obviously for use at night time. Um, normally this is turned off. But if I turn the rear light on, the strip light comes on. You see it there. Just gives me a lot more light at night time better than this thing because it's useless so it's just connected into it what's next oh, I've got a pair of Titan rear drawers 900 by one one uh, meter 900 long one meter wide with an integrated fridge slide I'll show you those I have got a plan here. Um, so here's the integrated fridge slide. There's a little latch under here. Um, 
I have got a plan. I've got a couple of fridge slides. I bought one second hand. Uh, it's a large one, and I've got a small one here. Now, the large one will take my 75 litre dual zone fridge. The small one won't. It will take it width wise, but it won't take it length wise. So I'm thinking I might flatten the end down and just use the small one because it's a lot, a lot narrower than the large one. Because they're made to fit certain sizes of fridge. Okay. I've got a centre console fridge, a 15 litre centre console fridge here. As you can see, it's partially frozen. It's on too cold. It needs to be on zero. This is a compressor, fridge and freezer. It's not a piezoelectric piece of crap like the Kuhlman I used to have that took four hours to get cold. It is a compressor, fridge, freezer and it sits in there and it does a really good job. I'm really happy with it. Kings have upgraded that since. They've got a new 16 litre now, but uh, I'm more than happy with that one. I've got King's front, front, original front canvas seat covers. They're getting a bit worn now. They've had them in a couple of years. I'll probably replace them with something else, but at this point, I'm not replacing them. So, Adventure Ridge Dual Zone 75 litre fridge freezer. That's at home. I can't show you that now, but it fits on one of those fridge slides or it fits on my fridge slider. I've got two 120 ampere hour lithium uh, batteries sitting in there, connected in parallel, giving us a total of 240 ampere hours. Uh, I have a Renergy DC to DC charger, which is under that box. Just let me bear with me. Uh, I've been to Aldi. Yes, I've been to Aldi and I bought myself a brush cutter. So there's the Renergy DC to DC charger charging the batteries. I also have a Renergy shunt, which I can't show you, but I do have the screen down there, which is recording the, um, the 240 amper hours plus 100 percent, and I'm at 13.5 volts. That is really useful. That tells you your power going in, how long your batteries will last, etc., etc. I have an auxiliary pump and gauge. I'm going to have to be brief here because the battery is quite low. So when I turn the ignition on, the radio comes on, as you can see. Yet when I turn on the start the engine, the radio turns off. That's what was causing the, the Oricom UHF radio to lock up. I had to stop the engine, leave it for two minutes for it to reset. So it was a bit of a problem when you were with a few of the people because you were stopping and having to wait. and You couldn't speak to them and tell them. Please accept my apologies. The video died at this point, so I'm having to do a voiceover. So what I was saying was that the UHF radio was locking up uh, when you started the car. When you stopped the car, when the radio was turned on, you can restart the car. It couldn't cope with that moment where all everything turns off to give all full power to the starter motor. So what I did was I fitted a 10 second delay timer. So now the radio doesn't come back on, it waits 10 seconds before it starts up and that's fixed the problem. Oricom were interested but they couldn't resolve the issue they couldn't work it out in their heads what the problem was even though i explained it to them the issue has is not been resolved with the radios not that i'm aware of anyway it still is ongoing so if you're considering a timer you can get, you can get them on ebay with the pioneer radio your head unit that is there for usb radio and radio channels and google maps mainly just for navigation on the road it's a little bit better than the vms navigator it's easier, you can just tell it where you want to go and it, and it reads it out to you in a reasonable voice. So that's not bad. So that's why I have that. Apart from that, that's about it. That's the entire car walk around. I don't think I've missed anything. If I have, please ask me in the comments and please remember, please like and subscribe. And if you want to join Patreon, the script of this will be in Patreon. And if you don't want to join patreon consider buying me a coffee the channel needs some support and it's getting harder and harder to, to meet the demands of people so i just would appreciate some support if possible if you can't then that's fine but thank you anyway cheers bye